Lord, we are blessed to be here today. Thank you for the wonderful fall weather, Lord, that you are sovereignly in control of, Lord. Your promises and your word are so rich and vast. Lord, help us to just plumb the depths of your word today, Lord, as we look at um, the, um, the falsehood that's out there, Lord, and how to think rightly about this. Um, bless the word of your, or the preaching of your word today in, um, in church service, Lord, as well. Help to prepare our hearts and minds as we go. Um, Bless this time. Again, Lord, thank you for the fellowship of the saints. We ask all these things in your precious holy name. Amen. Okay, so let's get started. I will try to go a little slower. I was a little fast last time. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just the way my brain works. But So class agenda. So last class we did check out the true, I got that right, God, the triune God, attack on God's deity. We went over some of the themes theisms. We're going to go over those again real quick. This class is the main point, really, is just Jesus is God. Um, any good answer to any theological question, you can always say Jesus, right? Uh, the attack uh, on the deity of Christ, that we will dive into when we start to look at the issues of Islam, and what Christians should know. All right, you'd be surprised how many Christians don't want to understand or have any idea about what they teach, what they believe, what they know, uh, and how to even think rightly about that. So I think that's something that we all Christians should know. Uh, commonly used objections, and then a biblical response and how to respond to those. Not just from a logical perspective, but also from a biblical perspective. Alright, so by way of review, we checked out the different theisms. We had polytheism, we, did a, we talked a little bit about that and the beliefs thereof. Atheism, agnosticism, um, uh, panentheism, right? There's a little bit of divine in everything. We discussed the monotheism view between Unitarian and Trinitarian. And by way of review, continuing with the different theisms, generally speaking, monotheism, we had the two different views there, Unitarian and who believes that? We kind of talked a little bit about those different groups with the question mark there, who is and what they believe when they started all these different groups. So Jehovah Witnesses, they are Unitarian. One is Pentecostals, they are Unitarian. Some groups of Judaism are still Unitarian. Uh, Inglesias Christos, again, that's the one that most people may not know. That was the one that we were discussing that started in the Philippines, um, where there's been some debates with James White on it, um, and they are dominantly Filipino. So I have lots of Filipino friends, and some of them have issues with those folks. The Hebrew Israelites, these are a newer group of people that have uh, shown up. Uh, Any time you spend downtown in San Francisco and you see a group of men dressed, whether, you know, usually a darker complexion, dressed in some interesting looking garbs with their tassels. They always have their tassels out. And then they'll have a bunch of signs and the 12 tribes and how each tribe represents a different ethnic group and so forth. And then they're usually all in unity singing or saying something about what the Bible says. And the Lord said this. That's what they'll do. And then if you try to engage with them, they'll just shut you down. Right? Because their religious view is not based on truth, it's based on your skin tone or your skin color. All right? uh, it's a very difficult, difficult group to reason with and discuss with. Uh, again, Islam will be discussing that, and I think it's, I just want to highlight this point. The same arguments that people see coming from Islam are now in, uh, going out in the secular world. You're going to see people grabbing on to the same questions that Islam is throwing at Christians because why is that the case? Why do people have this concept to grab a hold of these questions? Is the reason the reason being because is because that these when you are getting questioned like this, you don't have a response. Most Christians don't have a response to these questions. And so they grab a hold of it as a hey, I have a prize, I have a winning question that can throw Christians off. And so I'm going to grab a hold of it. So not just Islam, but also the secular secular world. And then uh, a few other ones that were uh, in the 5th and um, uh, 5th century and so forth. Okay, by way of review again, just from our perspective, right? 
uh, for the Unitarian has a fundamental, the Unitarian view has a fundamental flaw. Can anyone remember what that was? Not a soul. There's no way to, uh, to have God expressing his characteristics and perfections such as love apart from being plural. Exactly. That's exactly it. Again, this is this is the fundamental um, Achilles heel of their particular view. We discussed the definition of God being a supreme being. God being a supreme being cannot be dependent on something else. And a Unitarian monotheistic God is dependent on its own creation to be personal. And yet, we see the Quran or whatever it is, whatever text they have, just having that text is revealing that that God's, the view, is personal. Okay? So this is a fundamental key point that we need to hold on to. The person, uh, in order to be a personal God, or in order for their God to be personal, it is now dependent on its own creation, and a supreme being cannot be dependent on anything. Right? But not, a, not true in the triune view. Right? God was perfectly sufficient, with or without creation. Right? God doesn't need us. He was perfectly sufficient. So that's the chess chess piece getting knocked over there for your check mark. Okay? But it doesn't stop there, right? We have to continue. The gospel is paramount. We're going to discuss that a little bit as well. So theisms, again, monotheism, here's our side of the fence, right? The three distinct persons. Trinitarian view. So we looked at three truth points. That God is represented uh, as one being, not one person. And then we have scriptures to go along with that. Again, this is all by way of review. I will send out the slide deck together, so you'll get both decks. Uh, I will probably hand it over to Peter, and he can send it out to the class. Uh, point number two is that Scripture presents that the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are God and worshipped as God. And then we took a closer look into that regarding Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then the last point was that the three persons are distinct from each other. Okay. Engaging the Muslims. The basic things every Christian should know about Islam. Okay. Islam grows not by power, not by might generally. They grow by ignorance and deception. Uh, case in point, uh, in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s, you, you may recall a rising of African Americans grabbing a hold of Islam. Why is that? What, what, what rationale is that? Is that because they're directly coming from Africa and coming over here, and then that's what the religion is that they had? No. Islamist groups were going into these people's groups and deceiving them and saying that the evil white man is where uh, all of the slavery took place and started. Okay? And so, because Allah and Muhammad are champions and don't want slavery, you should join our side of the fence. Well, if, it doesn't take long to do any you know, five-minute study of history to know that Islam dominantly ran the slave trade. Right? So, again, why did all these people join into this idea of Islam and so forth? It's really based off of ignorance and, de and deception. Right? Even well-meaning Christians may have a dialogue and, again, they're going to be getting asked questions that they can't respond to, right? and then their faith is shaken. Right? I don't want that to happen. I want your faith to be emboldened here. Okay? The worst possible sin that a Muslim can commit is... I should have put my question mark up there. Anyone know? It's called shirk. Shirk. This is the sin of associating or asserting a partner with Allah. So saying Jesus is Lord would be committing shirk. Okay? Think about that. That's what we claim all the time. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. So what is the punishment for leaving Islam? 
It's death. It's death. You may not know that that happens today, but it does. We live in a society where uh, that's probably going to get called out, right? If somebody says, hey, you're leaving Islam, all right, and then they're gone, right? If, in most cases, they probably would call the police. But this does happen in, in Islamic countries still today, okay? So Christians who are in places that are dominantly Muslim are constantly under attack, um, and fear for their life. I have, a, um, I have an acquaintance with an, another brother who is in Pakistan and recently had to go to trial. At least they were somewhat civil. Had recently had to go to trial and they're still waiting the outcome of that trial. He could potentially be put to death. Uh, he's a missionary over there. I should have said that. That's the caveat. <laughs> Um, additionally here, so when we say we preach the gospel, the good news to a Muslim, what do they hear? Call Jesus Lord and I'm going to get my head cut off. So, yes, the gospel is the message that saves, but we have to sometimes take down some of these ideas, these false narratives when we start preaching the gospel to people. That's been drilled into their head since they've been little, if they're coming from a Muslim family. Uh, and they hate Jews and Christians, as mentioned in the teaching of Muhammad. And we're going to answer the question as to why that is the case. <laughs> All right. Basic things Christians should know about Islam. We're going to do a quick review of the following. We're going to define some definitions. We're going to define what t uh, Islam teaches about God, what they teach about Jesus, what they teach about Christians, and what they teach about the Quran, and what they teach about Muhammad, and the common Muslim objections to Christianity. This is where we need to pay real close attention. So some definitions. Islam means submission. Okay, that's what it actually means. And then a Muslim is someone who submits to Allah, right? That makes a little bit of sense. Muhammad is the messenger who came around 610 AD and would receive a message from Allah. Okay? That date is important. Okay, so remember 600 to 610 AD. Remember that. The Quran means to uh, recite or resuscitation. Um, a recitation, I'm sorry, to recite things, right? It's a direct speech that was given from Allah to Muhammad. A couple things to discuss about that. For recitation, um, how many of you know that there's a book, one of the uh, big truth little books on Islam? How many know that? Yes? Yes? There's one, there's probably a copy of it in the bookstore. Um, I would recommend, it's a very quick read. You could read it. In there, I believe it's Pastor Cliff who's um, being the main uh, person writing and talking. But he says that he knows of a person who has memorized the entire Quran in Arabic and doesn't understand Arabic. So I'm just going to remember the whole entire thing but not understand a word that it says. Yeah, that's, right? cool. yeah, that's real helpful, right? <laughs> You know, I mean, if I could just memorize, you know, a couple books of the Bible, I'd be, I'd be set, right? And I could actually understand it. But that's, that's devotion, right? And that, I guess, I, if, I, if I recall from the book, I believe that individual ended up becoming a Christian, right? Because, obviously, right? Um, but, and an additional point here to discuss is when Allah spoke this to Muhammad, remember, Muhammad is believed to be illiterate. He can't read. I don't think he was able to write either, so a lot of this stuff is given to him and then somebody else was writing it for him. Um, notice the difference. That's not how we get the Word of God. So we're not, I mean, Moses did receive direct revelation, right, from God. But in this case, the revelation that we received is through the authors and God used the authors of the Bible through their literary abilities. So all of Scripture for us is God-breathed, Theonoustos. It literally was brought, breathed out by God. Not dictated, right? So it wasn't like, oh, I hear a voice. What's that, God? And then they start typing or they write something down. They get out their scrolls, right? That's how Islam sees their Quran being written. Um, and interestingly enough, in the Quran it says you have to obey and copy the patterns of the conduct of Muhammad. 
Yeah, guess what? It doesn't talk about his anything in the Quran. It doesn't talk about him doing anything. It doesn't have any of that information in it. Oh, Mr. Muslim, what are you going to do now? Well, that's why we came up with the Hadiths. We have to have a whole other set of books to find out what Muhammad uh, thought and taught about a whole range of different topics. Okay, so they hold to the Quran and the Hadiths. Okay, which is also another issue for them. Uh, what Islam teaches about God. Okay, and this will be interesting. You're going to see a similarity. Uh, to some degree, and then we're going to see where it all kind of falls off the rails. Okay? So Allah is all powerful. We would agree, you know, God is all powerful, right? Uh, just by way of um, mention and point, in some Arabic only speaking only uh, areas, Christians who are there still use the term Allah to refer to God, right? Just remember that. Um, so if you're talking to a Christian and they're saying Allah for some reason, you know, you might you might question that. But if they're claiming Christianity, they're claiming Christ. Allah to them is just another way of saying God in Arabic. Okay, so God is all powerful, and the the references there are from the Quran. Uh, verses are called surahs. Allah is all knowing and all wise, and we would agree. Yes, God is all knowing and wise. Right? Allah is just and merciful. Yes, we would agree with that. Allah created the universe. Yes, we would agree with that. Here's where it falls off the rails. <laughs> God is not a trinity. <clears throat> Sorry, we have now taken off to Albuquerque and you are going to Texas, somewhere else. <laughs> All right. Um, he is not a father, or Allah is not a father to anyone. Yeah. Does not love unbelievers. Yikes. Yikes. So God's all powerful, but he's not going to love anyone who's an unbeliever. What Islam teaches about Jesus, or um, Isha, Ishi, Isha, that's how they would say it. Uh, though, as a matter of fact, you'll hear them say Jesus' name, and a lot of the times they're going to say right after that, peace be upon him. Right? Anytime you hear some one of the prophets' names, they're usually going to follow up with peace be upon him. All right, so he was born of a virgin. Interesting. The caveat there is not by the same means that the Bible teaches, the, just the actual reproductive action that took place with God and Mary. That's how Jesus came to be. Um, so, slightly different, but yes, born of a virgin. Jesus did uh, many miracles. Yeah, we agree with that. Uh, Jesus is the Messiah, believe it or not. They hold to that as him being the Messiah. Jesus is Allah's word. Well, hmm, that sounds familiar. John 1, maybe? Jesus was born pure and sinless. Huh, interesting. There's some debate, some scholars go back and forth on the actual meaning of that particular passage where it talks about that. But in general, they believe that Jesus was sinless. But Muhammad was not, interestingly enough, and he was told to repent because he was sinless. Or sin, because he did have sin. Here's where it falls off the rails again. <laughs> Poor Thomas. <laughs> Jesus is the spirit from Allah. What? Wait, I thought he was an actual person. How can he be a spirit? Wait, are you saying that he's two in one? Are you talking about a dual nature now? That sounds a little bit more like Christianity. Hmm. He did not die on the cross. Believe it or not, there's actually some sects, uh, I think, of Sunni Muslims that actually think that Jesus did die on the cross, but that's usually not the general belief. So that's kind of a rare sect. And then, obviously, if he didn't die on the cross, he couldn't raise again from the dead. And he was not divine, obviously. I mean, he's just a prophet, right? Now, what Islam teaches about Christianity? <coughs> Christianity... They have scriptures from God. That's what the Quran teaches. We have scriptures. Christianity is the nearest in friendship to Muslims. Yeah. Huh. Well, who would have thought? All right. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
Christians are compassionate and merciful. As we should be. <laughs> Absolutely. And at some point in time, there was a shift for Muhammad. Right? Deuteronomy 18 talks about a prophet to come. He grabbed a hold of that with all of his might and said, That must be me! I must be this prophet. And I know that the Jews and the Christians are going to embrace that. They're going to see me as their prophet. So as he's building up his group of people that are followers of him, he takes a little trip, meets up with some Jews, and they laugh him out of the room. Guess that made him feel a little bitter, okay? And so now, that's where the hatred and the animosity for Jews come from, right? They laughed him out of the room. He wanted nothing to do with the Jews, but still was kind of buddy-buddy with the Christians because he hasn't talked to any actual Christians yet, apparently. Um, he was still thinking that he is this prophet to come. And so, obviously, he, in the Quran here, he's like, yeah, you know, that's, Christians are the nearest friends to Muslims. Let's see how long that took. Christians who believe in the deity of Christ are unbelievers. Uh-oh, something's changing here. Christians who are unbelievers are the worst of creatures. Oh, no. Yeeks. Muslims should not be friends with Christians. Okay. Interesting. Right? Why is this the case? Why is this this back and forth? Well, finally, he was engaging with Christians who wanted nothing to do with him as the prophet because they knew who the prophet was that was being spoken of, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christians now are to be fought and subjugated because of their unbelief. According to the Quran, what the, te what the Islam teaches about the Quran, okay? It's the best of all books, really. That's what they believe. It's the greatest of all books. It has everything you need to know. It's scientific, uh, which it's not. Uh, it's historic, which it's not. And all the other great things that come from God are in the Quran. It's free from error. Hmm, inerrancy, right? Well, we believe something along those lines as well. Allah protects the Quran from corruption. Hmm, really? Well, why did they have to destroy a whole bunch of copies of it and find one copy and only use that copy? Because the other copies weren't from Allah? I don't understand. But that's what ended up happening. And then, real quick, what Islam teaches about Muhammad. We talked a little bit about this, right? We have to follow the pattern and conduct for all Muslims is Muhammad. Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, meaning he was the last prophet, right? All of the cults out there always want to claim that their prophet was the last prophet, except for you'd say maybe the LDS, because there's constantly new prophets that are coming along. Uh, and earlier prophets spoke about Muhammad, right? Engaging them... Here's where we're starting to get a little interesting. Common Muslim objections to Christianity. And if we can get a hold of these, not only are you, you know, well, we'll get there. I'll, we'll get there. The Bible has been corrupted, is their first objection. How many of you have heard that before? Hmm. The Trinity doesn't make sense. Okay. Where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? Now, we did discuss this a little bit last week, right? We went through quite a few different uh, parts of the scriptures, part of, uh, of where Jesus claimed this. And we'll get into a little bit as, again this time. How can God die? How can God punish one person for the sins of another person? If Jesus died for your sins, can't you sin all you want? Now, you might say, hey, you know, that's, those are all interesting questions that the Muslim has. No, that's not just Muslims who have those questions. Many people out in the world today will have the same questions. Many Christians may even have the same questions. Right? 
One of our favorite verses, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your heart, regard Christ as Lord, as holy, or Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that's within you. Yet do this with gentleness and reverence, keeping with a clear conscience, so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. Shame is the outcome of guilt. Remember that. <clears throat> guilt is a judgment. Shame is a reaction. Um, in this particular case, how do we live out 1 Peter 3.15 with a Muslim, or anybody for that matter, in light of these objections? Well, there's an additional benefit to studying some of this stuff. Not only should we be able to answer and be able to defend our position, but we will grow in our own knowledge and boost our own faith. Right? So this is a benefit to Christians to be able to answer these questions. Okay. Common Muslim objections of, to Christianity. The Bible has been corrupted. This is the main one. This is the starting point. Because if you can get past this hurdle, all of the other scriptures that we have are still playable. They're still on the field. Okay? But we're going to look at their own scriptures first. Right? Sarah 6, 114. I shall seek a judge other than Allah, while it is he who has sent down unto you the book. What is the book here? You say the Bible. Any guesses? Shout it out. No? The Quran. He's speaking of the Quran here. The book. Explain in detail. So Allah gave you the book, and He explained it in detail. Those whom we gave the Scriptures... And the Injil, or the Torah and the Injil. I know that it is revealed from your Lord in truth. Right? So, be not you of those who doubt. Ah, so now we have the Quran, we have the Torah, and the Injil. That is the Gospel. Right? So when you're talking to a Muslim, it's like, hey, do you have a copy of your Injil that you're supposed to read? They'll say no. Although, there are copies of it. You can get copies of it. And you can give them out to Muslims, which I've done in Israel, of all places. Yeah. At a pride parade, of all places. <laughs> and he was just working the grounds, of all places. It's a great photo. Um, I should have put that up here. He would have loved it. So here's this guy. He's like, you have a copy of the Jeel? He's like, no, I don't know, no. He's like, oh, I know I have to read the Jeel. Well, guess what? I have a copy right here for you. And he, and he, he took it. He took it and put it in his pocket. So, praise God, hopefully he uses that to his glory. Okay, so the Quran is already talking about the scriptures, which is the Torah and the Injil. Okay, remember that. More, O people of the book, you have no grounds to stand upon unless ye stand afast the law, which is what? Torah. Torah. The gospel and all the revelation has come down to you from your Lord. Okay, so again, they're pointing to the scriptures here. Despite ye not with the people of the book. This particular book, you are right, this is the Bible. This is the Torah and the Gospel. Now it's telling, hey, don't dispute with us. Don't argue with me. I've thrown that at someone one time. He's like, are you arguing with me? He's like, oh, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> we believe in the revelation which has uh, come down to us, in that which come down to you. Our Allah, your Allah is one, and it is to Him we bow. Okay. So, I say to my Muslim friends, so wait a minute, you believe the Quran, but the Quran is telling you to believe the Bible. Why don't you believe the Bible? Again, their argument is, oh, because the Bible's been corrupted. Au contraire. Sarah 6, 115. The very next Sarah verse after 6, 114 says what? The word of thy Lord doth find its fulfillment in truth and in justice. None can change your words. His words. Or his words. Sorry, thank you. None can change his words. For he is the one who heareth and knoweth all. Okay, so Mr. Muslim, you just told me 
that the Bible's corrupted, but his words can't be changed, and because they've previous revelations from Allah, they can't be changed. So if the Quran is true, the Bible is true, and if the Bible is true, the Quran is false. And now they're stuck with a conundrum. They have to come back to the agreement and the understanding that the Bible actually is true, according to their own Quran. Otherwise, guess what they just committed? Shirk. Shirk. Sure. Geeks. <laughs> now, but wait, wait. <laughs> there's more. <clears throat> the Injil, the Gospels, the scriptures that Muhammad had at the time, right? He, he's giving this information. The Quran stands on the back of the Bible. If you take the Bible away, the Quran will make absolutely no sense, even more so than it doesn't make sense now. Right? It doesn't give you an information about who Moses was, or who Aaron was, or who Noah was, or who Adam and Eve were, or any of the other prophets. It has no foundation and explanation of who these people are. It just assumes you know who they are, because it has a, ba a biblical background. Okay? So, Muhammad had to have had scriptures that he's pointing to. He talks about it in the Quran. So he knows that there are scriptures that are there. He's had to have had given these scriptures and either been read to the, him or he would, uh, someone would explain them to him to some degree. So if that's the case, which ones are they? Which ones are they? Guess what? The Peshidha was a Aramaic translation of both the New Testament, the majority of it, and the Old Testament. The Peshidha was, we still have copies of it dating back, actual copies today, dating back to 400 AD. What's the problem with that? Who remembers when uh, Islam actually, actually started? 600. 600 AD. So guess what, Mr. Muslim? You have scriptures today that predate your own religion that we have actual copies of today. You know how close it is to what we have in our own English Bibles? It's missing a couple books, like 2nd uh, and 3rd John. But all of the claims to deity of Jesus Christ are there in the text that predates his religion, and we still have it today. This is a, a like kill shot, if you want to ask me. Most people don't even make this argument. I don't understand why. There were no other translations in Arabic at that time. None that we can find, but that we know of, that was ever made mention of. Okay? And all the passages of Jesus and his deity are still clear examples. Here we go. 1 John 1.18 No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who himself, or who is himself God, and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. That's directly from the Peshitta. <laughs> Yikes, your arguments sinking. I am and the resurrection, all of these passages are still there. Okay. John 14, 14. Actually, does anybody have a King James with them? Open your King James to this passage for me real quick and then read it. Volunteers. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee while we do that. <laughs> John 14, 14. Yeah, John 14, 14. Go ahead. Yeah. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you shall ask anything in my name. Most of the critical texts will say, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. Right? This text, the Peshitta gets it right. It says, me. So, this is a claim to deity by Jesus himself. He's the one who can grant you, give you, whatever you're asking for. Right? It's amazing. Right? So we have an actual historical text that we can point to, which really dissolves the, the issue of, well, we don't have a, a we, all the Bibles today are corrupted. We can't, we, you can't actually use that argument, because I can go back to the text and point to you from 
the same text that Muhammad would potentially have to make any claims that he has. So your argument doesn't really have any, any you know, standing. But wait, there's more. <laughs> because we don't necessarily go off of the evidence that we have. Those are great evidences for us. But we just need the Bible anyways, right? So... Um, since the Bible is the authority, God's Word, we know it's inerrancy because it points to itself as the ultimate authority. Now, if you were here for the, um, the lesson that we did on uh, there's no neutral grounds, right? The myth of neutrality. We know that the Bible is our authority. It's our ultimate authority, right? And so all ultimate authorities must prove themselves... Right? And my example for that is, again, I'll, I'll use it so we can refresh our memories. If I told you I was the strongest man in the world, and you told me, you know, okay, well, prove it, but don't use your strength, right? That's a self-refuting, right? I can't actually do that because I'm appealing to myself as the ultimate source of strength, right? I'm the strongest, but I can't use my strength to show it. It's the same concept. We use the Bible to prove the Bible is true because if we put any other authority above the Bible, that becomes the ultimate authority. The Bible is no longer our authority, okay? I know that's a little complex. Early for the morning, drink your coffee. But it, it makes sense if you think about it. Um, so we're going to look at what the Bible says. So Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of your word is true. All of it. Not some of it. All of it. Right? John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. Okay. And then Matthew 5.18, I like this one just because it, it, it says that we have the Scriptures. Nothing's going to change from it. The law is there. We're not going to change it. It's not going to change. It will never go away. Jesus is in control of all of that. Okay, next. The Trinity doesn't make sense. Okay? So, how is that an argument? I mean, just because I don't know something or don't understand something, that doesn't make it not true. Calculus is true, right? Well, I don't know how to do calculus very well. I mean, I, that's, that doesn't mean it's not true, right? I don't know where kangaroos and how they ended up in Australia, but they're still there. Right? That doesn't make it not true. <laughs> so, you need to, you know, get educated. You need to understand it. You need to t take it and set aside your presuppositions and embrace what Christians say about it. Notice, I don't know if I put this in here, I don't think I did, but their concept of the Trinity is wrong. Even though in the, in the, in the Quran it talks about the Trinity, but you know who they make the Trinity out to be? They have, like, for instance, they don't believe in a Trinity. And they say if you believe the Trinity, which is what Christians believe, it's wrong. What they say Christians believe as the Trinity is wrong. They believe that it's, we, they believe Christians believe, <laughs> in the Quran it says that it's the Father, God, Allah, Jesus, and Mary. <laughs> so their objections to the Trinity, we actually would agree with. Yeah, that's not the Trinity. Yeah, it's not a Trinity. That's not what it is. Um, so how can we define, uh, how can a, I'm sorry, how can a finite human being fully grasp an infinite God? We are His creation, okay? It's not really possible. We can only know what God has revealed to us, right? We only know through the revelation that he's been, He has brought to us, which is the, through the general revelation, right? We have Romans 1, God's created the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, that everyone's without an excuse, a little caveat is that, remember, if everyone was without an excuse, how, why do we have all these other religions? Well, they're running from the true God that they do know. Right? There's no such thing as an atheist and all these other religions. They're running from the God that they do know. They're making up an idol. They're making up a false God or mo multiple gods. And then we have special revelation, which is Scripture. It's God-breathed. It's directly from Him. Okay? As we have shown in, uh, in our previous weeks here, that God has revealed Himself in the pages of Scripture as a triune, one God, three persons. Matthew 8, uh, sorry, Matthew 28, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thrice. Holy, 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 the angels speak. That's thrice. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the God, I'm sorry, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. All three, right there, black and white. And then John 14, 23. Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Right from the Peshitta. Why did Jesus say, I am God? Where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? And we studied this at great lengths already, but here's another massive list for everybody. <laughs> right? The amount of evidence is overwhelming, greater than if he actually said, I am God, worship me. He has power to forgive sins. He did that. The Jews became unhinged. They did not like that. He is greater than the temple. Tear down this temple. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the king of uh, a kingdom, and the angels are his. He gathers his elect. He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He was to be killed and raised from the dead. He is omnipresent. Oh, not the omnis. He is omniscient. There we go. He is omnipotent. He gave his life as a ransom for many. He gives his life. He gives eternal life. He gives, or he is the monogamous theos, the unique and one of a kind, right? That came from heaven. He is the pre, he is preexistent with the shared glory of the Father. With the Father. Yes, with the Father. He is immutable. He is worshipped as God. Okay? This should be enough. <laughs> right? How can God die? Well, that's a misunderstanding of Jesus and his two natures. Right? If Jesus is truly God and truly man, which he is, he was truly God and truly man. Man, he was born as a baby, he grew up, he ate, he slept, spoke, felt fatigue, etc. I don't know, I can relate. But as God, he was born of a virgin, so no ties directly to Adam in that sense, right? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He made claims to deity. He received worship. He forgave sins. He did miracles, etc. The objection here is not really geared toward Jesus and his divinity. Or it is really geared, sorry. It's really geared toward his, towards Jesus and his divinity. We have already addressed this in several uh, scriptures and texts already. And if Jesus was only a prophet, let me toss the question back to you. How was he able to make claims like he gives eternal life, right? As we see in John. He is the resurrection and the life. Again, in John. So, just enough to throw a, sh you know, a little stone in someone's shoe. Maybe that's a little too many stones. <laughs> but, I mean, toss all of them in there that you got. Right? Again, we want to ask the right questions to leave them with a conundrum. How can God punish one person for the sins of another? That's a great gospel question. Wow, the door just opened for the gospel conversation. Awesome. That's a great question. This ties back to the previous question. Can't only God forgive sins? Yeah. Wages of sin is death, whether by natural cause or in your case, by stoning someone. Right. We've all sinned. But did Jesus sin, according to your own Quran? And according to the Injil, right? Jesus, did he die on a cross? Right? Was he the sin bearer? Yes, the Injil teaches that. 1 Peter 2.24 2, He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree, so that... Having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Wow. That's in the Injil. 
And according to both Torah and Injil, Jesus gives life as a ransom for many. Mark, I think that's maybe supposed to be 10. <laughs> Uh, for even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Well, there's the Torah, the forbidden passage, Isaiah 53, 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, for he bore their wrongdoings. Amazing. Amazing. If Jesus died for your sin, can't you sin all you want? Well, any, any Christian who spends any time in Romans is going to know that one. right? This is a common misunderstanding of the new birth. We must be born again. Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith and repentance. Right? 1 John 3, 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning. Actually, some, past, some other renditions of this might not even use the word practice, but it is in the Greek. Right? Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, and the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seeds uh, abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. All right. This particular Greek word here, there it is, uh, in both of the usages there, refer to a practice or an ongoing of sin in a particular manner. Okay? Maybe it's a little small on the font. You can't really see it, but that's okay. Jesus told you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So when you say, peace be upon him all the time, Mr. Muslim, how are you engaging with this? So then, to not obey would be willingly sin, would be not loving him, and so therefore, not born again. Right? Even more fundamentally, we are saved by grace through faith, therefore... Titus 2, 11 and 12. For by the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing them to deny ungodliness. So no, Mr. Muslim, you can't continue to sin because your sins have been forgiven. Right? That, doesn't, that shows that you don't understand it. That shows you don't understand the grace of God. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness right, and worldly lusts. And live in a sense, uh, and to be able to live sensible, righteous, and godly in this present age. Okay. So, conclusion. We can always grow in our biblical understanding and knowledge of doctrine and be prepared and be ready to give a, for the, uh, an answer for the hope that's within us. We can all do that. Okay. Doctrine and theology are not dirty words. Some Christians think they are. Right? Our faith is based, uh, is both tested and encouraged by our studies. So all these things that we're studying right now, we can understand and it can help bo uh, booster our faith. We really don't need to defend the scriptures. They stand alone. All right? They are self-authenticating. Uh, but we should be able to rightly present them and know them, study to show ourselves approved, rightly handling the Word of God. Right? The right, Jesus makes all the difference. It's life or death. That's on the line. Okay? Matthew 16, 13 through 17. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, he uh, it's supposed to be he asked a he asked the disciples this: Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others say Jeremiah or the one of the other prophets. He stops and says, no, but you, he's asking them directly, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. How critical is it that we get the right Jesus? How critical is it 
The deity of Christ is paramount. He was God in the flesh. He came to save His people from their sins. We are the benefactors because our faith is in Him. The right Jesus. If we get the wrong Jesus, we're condemned. We, are, we have no hope. So understanding this from any Unitarian position is fundamental for us as Christians and to love our neighbor as ourself when we're engaging with them. And that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thoughts? Yes, Scott, we'll go this way. In one of your earlier slides, Adam, you mm -hmm. said that uh, the Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yes. Do you have any... I don't have that what type of messiah yeah you know, so in a sense of a messenger and a, um, somebody who came it was predicted to come I think they hold to some of that um, I'd have to dig a little bit deeper into what the scholars say about that uh, and whether I really want to spend that much time in digging that up I have some other brothers who are very very well um, um, grounded in this particular conversation so I can always ask them too to find out a little bit more about that it says prophesied of one to come but not necessarily a savior of the world that's that's right. It's not necessarily a savior, but um, one that was probably, I think they, what they would say is it was for the Jews, okay. right? And then they rejected him, right? And he didn't actually die on the cross, as we said, but God saved him and took him to heaven, kind of like an Elijah. Interesting. Yeah. And then um, just a comment here that uh, they believe the Bible has been corrupted. And there are a number of Christians that I know that believe yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Inerrancy is, a, is an issue yeah. for a lot of people. Um, but <laughs> it's pretty clear for us, I think. Yes? Uh, do the Muslims have a concept of heaven and hell? They do. Uh, they would call paradise as one. That's that, that's what they would say. And I actually had a guy explain to me their position. For, an, a Muslim was trying to explain their position. Their judgment day is it's pretty out there. When I was hearing what he was talking about, it was I was thinking of like a science fiction type of movie, right? Because it's really out there. There's chains involved and all this craziness that happened to people. They're all under this wrath that's being poured out, and then it's basically up to Allah to decide if the person is going to endure an eternal punishment of some degree. Yeah, I, And I don't know if everyone agrees. I think there's some sects out there who think that um, there's an annihilation perspective as well. There's some people who believe in annihilation. Like, you you die, you punish, and that's it. You're not suffering for eternity. So I think there's there's a mixed bag. Yes. There's something beyond this life. That's right. Absolutely. Yep. This is it. Nope. There's a paradise out there, and you can have, you know, 42 versions, and all that other stuff that or 72 whatever it is yeah all right let's keep up in it why stop at 72 yes i think one of the many uh, indications that the quran is written by satan is that the mahdi who is the one to come mm. has all the get manifestations and characteristics of yes the quran that our antichrist has in the bible that's yes, right and their false prophet well they're the messiah for them jesus christ is a prophet who comes to announce the coming of the 12th Amendment, who is the mahdi mm. and their jesus says i know muslim meals become muslims too yep. and exactly what the false prophet in our bible says yep. I mean, the, the parallels are actually absolutely perfect yep and uh so it's just very interesting how satan is completely inverted what the bible says and presents as Christ. and it's interesting you make a good point that Islam, muslims are all arminian because they believe that you have free choice yep. to do what you want. And they're all post-millennial because they believe <laughs> we will introduce the kingdom yep. and then the 12th Ayman will come. That's what the, the whole uh, you know, Muslim world believes. Yep. So it's so interesting how it's the exact inverse of Christianity. It, I mean, Satan does that all the time, right? He takes whatever God has and distorts it. Look at marriage. Look at human sexuality. Look at the gender issue. Right? All that stuff. God's designed it a certain way and it's completely inverted and that's that's not a new tactic right he's if it works I'm gonna keep on doing it. I think that's what he's thinking yes so when you talk about the Trinity 
with a Muslim and they would admit that we're finite beings mm -hmm. and truly understand it. Yeah. What do you stand on? Because and even I think John MacArthur says, I'm going to make you feel comfortable in not understanding this. Yeah, yeah he's, it's fine to not understand, right? Yeah. What we don't want to do is make the error of creating the wrong understanding in the Muslim's mind, right? If we can't articulate it correctly, probably not good to go into those those realms. I think I've made the mistake before, and I'm like, oh, after I was thinking about what I said, it's like, yeah, I didn't represent the Trinity very well. So just be cautious of that, because it's not an easy thing to discuss, especially with the Muslim, right? And there, again, that's just one of the few objections, right? There's tons of objections, uh, uh, objections, but those are the main ones, and those ones are the ones that are grilled into the minds of them, uh, of Muslims and so forth, and so if you can get uh, somewhat of a grasp on those conversations, starting again with that very first one, you'll, you'll get much further, alright? So um, it takes a little bit of practice to be able to discuss, say, issues of um, the, I, I would, you know what I would do? I probably wouldn't try to present it as a whole. I would probably, I would stick with Jesus as a deity, right? And they'll want to jump. That's what happens. You get on a good roll, they're going to want to jump to something else, right? Because there's no defense for what, what you're saying against them. So they're going to want to jump to another thing. That's what happens with practically anybody who can't argue their side, right? They might have a fundamental understanding because they've heard these arguments before, so they're going to jump with a, a standard question that most Christians aren't going to be able to respond. But if you can respond to it, they're not going to stay there. So you have to be able to drive them back to that point. All right, we can talk about that. We can talk about that. But back to my point here, right? You have to work at that. You have to practice that. Otherwise, you'll get moved all over the place. Muslims don't even understand their own. Um, depends. It really depends. There's the same issue. We have nominal sides, like you're talking to a Catholic. There's a nominal Catholic. Oh, I'm a Catholic. Well, do you go to Mass? Do you go to church? No. Well, how are you a Catholic? Oh, I was raised in that. Oh, okay. There are nominal Muslims as well. Right? Um, and again, since, since there's so many different variations on what area of the, say, the Quran you want to follow, or, or what area of the Hadiths you want to follow, you could have someone who's quote-unquote peaceful, and then you could have somebody over here who's, you know, would be, you know, a crazy jihadist or something, right? So it just, it, it, it takes some practice, takes some thinking through, understand our side of the fence first, right? And then, then you can start to maybe engage with somebody, right? Don't be afraid to engage, right? Don't be afraid because you have the truth on your side. There's nothing to fear, right? Christ is with you. Um, it's interesting when you see a, a Muslim can, uh, have a conversation with a Muslim that has converted to Christianity. And I've seen them press the other guy, like, well, why don't you just get up and murder me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's his restraint? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Because they're commanded to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, but and, and by the way, Muslims, Muslims who have converted to Christianity make great Christians, by the way. Yeah. Right? Because they've been taught this whole thing that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to die for the faith and so blah, blah, blah. So they have a very uh, passion and, you know, a passion for reaching other people of their own side. Right? It, they make great evangelists. Angeles to Muslim. Yes, Patrick. And so, like the majority of the Muslim world, uh, rather, uh, much of the Muslim countries are not under Sharia law. And I was just wondering, from your point of view, would you say the uh, majority of Muslims are nominal? Uh, no, I would say uh, actually the the dominant countries that would be considered is Islamic are under Sharia law. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, they're, depending on how liberal they become, they might dial back some of the repercussions of it. Right, it gives in flow. But I think in the majority of the time, a Muslim country will hold to Sharia law. Um, quick two facts. In England, the number one male boy name, as of a few years ago, I forget how long ago, was Muhammad in England. So keep that in mind. Is, no, go ahead. So isn't it true there's some areas in England and France that are essentially under a Sharia law, like no go zones? Yeah, there's no go zones. Oh, yeah. Which is oh, yeah. That, you're right. You're right. And two, one of the fastest, I'm not sure if this is global, it may be global, one of the fastest growing areas in, um, for new mosques. <laughs> Minnesota. Minnesota? Texas. Yeah. Texas. Wow. So, and that was a, probably about 10 years ago. So, yeah. We, uh, we're blessed to be where we are, but sometimes um, 
I think uh, democracy can go too far awry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Thank the Lord. Lord, again, we're just so blessed that you are um, all-powerful, Lord, and that you have all knowledge, that you have written, um, you've seen us, Lord, before the foundations of the world. You've called us to your own, Lord, and thankful for salvation through Christ, Lord. Um, bless everyone here today, Lord. Help them to be encouraged in their faith with, um, with the truths that we have established in your word. Lord, help us to go forward from today here and to uh, worship. And uh, as we continue with that, uh, bless the service, Lord. And again, help give us eyes to see and ears to hear and uh, conv uh, convict our hearts, Lord, that we may grow closer to you. We ask all these things in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.